Hey, what's up guys? Hope everyone's doing really well. Wanted to hit another common question that I've been asked, which is how to host a website. So screencast video this week, kind of um, not too technical, but more of a big picture type of screencast. I just want to talk through basic ways that you can host a website. All right, so this was a common question I've been asked. There's going to be a decent amount of text in this document, but as always, just try to follow my voice and I'll do my best to try to explain the answer to this question. So I guess the big question is, what are different ways to host a website? <clears throat> First, just two important distinctions that we have to clear up up front. So there's two important things. One is hosting a web application or a website, and another thing is registration. And those are two separate actions. And for this video, we're going to be talking about hosting a web application. We're, gonna not, we're not going to talk so much about registration, but I just want to talk about it briefly here. So some websites like GoDaddy, uh, Namecheap, uh, Bluehost, there's a lot of websites out there that do both of these things as kind of like separate features. So if you go to GoDaddy.com, this is an official registration site for the internet where you can register a domain name like my favorite com like this is a domain and you can go to these official places to register them under your name and they provide web hosting too but it's also very likely that you could do these two things separately so you can use GoDaddy just for registration but you could use some other service some other service to host your applications all right GoDaddy just provides both of these things so today we're going to talk about different ways to host a website not we're not going to talk about website registration, which is another thing. So just get that clear in your head. All right. So what we're going to do in this video is that I kind of just broke down different levels of hosting a website. I came up with six levels. These are very high level, 10,000 bird's eye view type of levels. And we're going to start from the lowest level and go to the highest level. All right. It's always good to start on the lowest level of the stack. And there's a lot of text here, but I'm just going to read them, so just follow along. But the most, the lowest way to host a website is you run a website on your computer in your house that's connected to the internet. So this is probably good for pet projects, really like testing stuff out, just like messing around. If you run a website on your computer and your computer is hosted on the internet, that pretty much means your website is on the internet. All right, so. If you run your application and you have it listed on port 80 and your computer is connected to the internet, it's going to have an IP and people are going to be able to hit your website. All right. Even you can do this at a computer at your house. So some of the stuff that obviously it's not going to be like a real kind of server service. You probably won't keep your computer on 24 seven. You probably don't have any real internet bandwidth to support this. If you're paying like 40 bucks a month for internet, it's not going to support any significant traffic. And your personal computer is not really designed for this. All right. I did this in high school a little bit just to host Counter Strike servers for a couple hours when me and my friends wanted to play. And I was good enough for like five or 10 people to connect to my computer and we could play Counter Strike. All right. So moving on from that, um, number two is that you buy real server equipment. And you put it in your house. So this is probably how early internet companies like Google got started. They, they kind of call them garage data centers where you set up like a data center in your garage. I have a couple of funny pictures here from Silicon Valley. So it kind of looks like this. So you set up like a data center, data center in your living room and you host all your stuff up there, right? So this is like this is from Silicon Valley, the TV show. So if you haven't seen this, it's just pics from the show. But they've set up their own like data center in their living room, and they're uh, it caught on fire. So, so you can buy real server heavy duty. You can spend money and get heavy duty server equipment, and you can put it in your house. You can totally do this. You you can keep it on twenty four seven. You're going to pay a lot of money for electricity, and you probably also have to pay for some significant internet bandwidth to your residence. So you got to pay for something more than $40 a month. We're going to be paying like $400 a month or something. And you still have to manage all this stuff yourself, like putting out fires, pressing the restart button, you know, whatever it takes to 
manage that server equipment. But you can totally still put it in your house. And I think if you read crazy stories about Google, that's what those guys did in the early days. All right. So moving on to step three is that you can buy real server equipment and put it into a shared center. So a shared center probably looks something more like um, this, where there's just like racks and racks of internet space. This, this looks like it's from a movie, but pretty much um, what a shared center really means is that it's also called a co-location space. I've heard about this term, but it's pretty much a place to put your heavy duty server equipment that's not in your house. All right, so you pay for the computer, but you also pay to keep it somewhere safe. All right, so the, the space or the facility, they're going to take care of like electricity, internet bandwidth, cooling, and you pay for all this stuff like a rental fee. Um, so pretty much you could be paying for a little section of this room or something, and somebody else has another section, and a different company has a different section. Um, so somebody is probably on site, some poor soul is probably on site 24-7 to help you reset your computer. That's going to be someone's job, resetting computers, putting out fires. And um, I heard that sometimes if you do this, if they can't handle some simple things, you might still have to drive to the co-location center and like fix up your computer if like you can't do it remotely. All right. So what co-location kind of means is that the space, uh, we said this, but the space at the centers is kind of rented out to different companies and you pay for the space and you pay for the computers. And they call it rack space, but it's pretty much you pay for the amount of space that you want to fit in your with your computer. So if you got five computers, you'll pay this amount. If you have like 50 computers, you could pay this other amount. All right. And I guess co-location just means it's shared. Um, it's still like a data center, but I guess if you hear of the word data center, sometimes it's like a pure data center owned by one company, right? Like Google could have their Google data center in the middle of nowhere just for Google computers and it's not really shared for anyone else. Like this picture is actually inside Google. So this is probably like a real Google employee in one of their dedicated data centers and it looks like this madness. So, so that's, that's number three. You can buy real server equipment and you can put it in a shared space. So number four is uh, I think really similar. It's almost kind of like the same thing but I just split it out into a different category, but this one is you rent the server equipment and you put it in a shared data center. So everything is really similar to what we just talked about, but you also just rent out the hardware. You don't actually own the hardware. You rent the hardware and you rent uh, the space where you put it in. So the service provider owns all that stuff and the service provider is provides the space and the full hardware support. So good thing to note here is that even though you're just renting this computer, you still have like full access to the computer, right? It's essentially yours. You're just paying like a renting fee rather than like a house mortgage. So you can install whatever OS, you can install whatever software you want. You can go in there, um, reset things, maybe upgrade things if you want. As long as you're paying your rent on time, it's pretty much your computer. All right. Um, number five, uh, this is kind of, let me make this a new page. So number five is where most people these days sit and we're going to spend a little more time here. But number five is renting out a virtual private server. And this is what most people do. So it's a very similar feeling to number four, except you're renting out a virtual server. All right. So what exactly is a virtual server? But it's a pretty simple idea. If you just break it down, it's pretty much a virtualization of a computer on a physical computer. So you can have many different virtual servers on the same physical server. And you don't really care about the physical server, you just interact with a virtual computer. So what it, this essentially does is this essentially splits up the resources of a big powerful computer into less powerful computers. All right, so you could have a huge physical server with like 32 gigs of RAM and you split it up between four virtual computers, eight, both each with like eight, eight gigs of RAM. All right, so it's splitting up a big powerful computer into different virtualizations. Um, one important kind of 
problem or not problem they have is like the noisy neighbor problem. Uh, this is a pretty, I don't know if this is the right word to use, but I've heard this term noisy neighbor before, but pretty much with a virtual server, you're pretty much sharing the physical resources with someone else, right? Maybe there's one physical server and you have three virtual servers, all right? And you're renting one of those virtual servers and other people around the world are renting the two other virtual servers. If the other virtual servers use a ton of resources, like if the other two virtual servers are using a ton of disk I.O. or network I.O., they're writing a lot of files to the disk, they're pretty much doing a ton of stuff to the computer, they could actually slow down your virtual server's performance, right? Because in the end, it's kind of three virtual things running on the same real thing. So how do people deal with this? But if you have the infrastructure capabilities, you can recreate another instance of the virtual server on a different physical computer, or you can just spend more money and rent your own dedicated server, and you wouldn't have this virtual problem. But in the end, you don't have too much control over this. All right, so examples of virtual, uh, vir virtual private server rental services. I'm sure if you guys heard of these digital ocean Amazon web services, you don't have full, you still pretty much have full access to the computer. You have root access, you can install whatever, whatever software you want, and you're pretty much paying a renter's fee. And these providers are gonna give you updates if anything bad happens. So it's like, oh shit, we had a fire. Your, your physical computer broke down, or oh crap, we had to restart some physical machines that your virtual servers are on, just for your information. And finally, we're at the last level of this thing, um, and I think the, the term these days that people use to describe this is a platform as a service, or a PaaS, and the most common one I know is Heroku, and this is pretty much like a one-click shop for application hosting, so they handle a lot of the software management for you, and you have much less control. So pretty much one example of this is you create a Heroku Dino to run a Rails application. It's not really a computer. It's this like Heroku is going to set up a virtual server for you, and they're going to install all the software on that computer for you so you can run Rails. And all you have to worry about is programming a Rails application. You don't have to worry about setting up the computer. So you definitely have less control in this setting because you can't log directly into the computer. You can only do what Heroku allows you to do. So with much less control, uh, for all the hackers out there, that kind of sucks, but you do get some added benefits. Uh, one example of this is like database backups, right? For Heroku, a database backup system is like two clicks and you get it as a feature, right? You get daily backups of your database very scheduled consistently. All you do is pay money, but you can do it in one click. The alternative to this, the cheaper alternative to this, is that you can set up all of this yourself with your own servers, right? But then think about all that extra work you have to do. You gotta make sure you have enough disk space, make sure you have the backups, make sure you have the proper code to do the scheduling. So you definitely have less control, but you get more added benefits for free. And for many companies who don't have a lot of resources or developers, like if you don't have an engineer to manage this kind of stuff, a platform is a good option for you and you just have to spend more money. All right, so many startups are kind of, that's why many startups use Heroku because you can't afford a dedicated developer to handle all this infrastructure stuff for you. So if this service, if something like Heroku can do it for you, you're gonna spend money to have it done, all right? So that was a decent amount of info for one video, but I'm gonna share these documents. Pretty much what we talked about in this video, again, to summarize, is that we didn't really talk about registration. We just talked about different ways that you can host a web application. And there are six different ways, right? And if you just need a review, just go through these notes. Again, there's definitely a lot of different nuances, different probably variations of these schemes. But these are kind of like the big picture ideas of how you can e even host something on the internet. All right, so uh, hopefully that uh, was helpful. I hope you guys like got a little bit of insights on how these things are working on the internet. On the internet, but I encourage everyone to definitely look more into it. All right, because this was a very overview type of video. All right, hope this was helpful. 
please like, comment, and give me a thumbs up. All right?